We've all sat in those meetings before where we think, good grief, we could have achieved this outcome within two or three emails or maybe even a two second phone conversation. The reality is meetings can be a complete waste of time, but they don't have to be. In fact, with communication as the backbone of any successful business, it's never been more important to hold meetings, but hold meetings that are productive and they actually have a detailed roadmap to help you get from A to B and get the result that you're looking for. So in today's podcast, we have a gentleman coming back on the show, the one and only Mr. Al Levy from the Seven Power Contractor. And he's going to shed some light on something that I picked up while I was reading his book, which he coined the Meeting Manifesto. Now, guys, I really encourage you to listen to this. I've actually recorded this as a video as well. So if you want to head across to the show notes, which is available at the siteshade.com forward slash blog forward slash meetings. You'll be able to watch the video there. It's also up on YouTube. It's just been embedded. But guys, there's also some frameworks left behind for you, which you can get on that same page through the resource section. So if you, you can head across there, you can get hold of those frameworks. And I've actually off the back of that adopted this uh, philosophy so much that I created uh, in a Google Doc a complete framework that we use in all of our meetings now for all of my businesses. And it's brilliant. And I've left that there um, for you guys as well. So you can head across to the show notes so you can get hold of, get hold of that. Again, it's the scishow.com forward slash blog forward slash meetings. And um, just fill in, put your details into the form there and it will send you across to the page, which has three of our awesome resources and a link to that Google Doc that I spoke to you about. And that's all yours for the taking. You just need to make a copy of it and off you go. Anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoy this podcast. I uh, is a cracker. Al is a genius. He's been on the show 11 times. I just worked out. This is his 12th. And so uh, you will definitely get a lot out of it. He's a real character uh, all the way from the United States. Lovely guy. And um, he really is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to contracting and trade businesses. So I encourage you guys to get across there. Go and download his book from Amazon. The links are all on the the, um, show notes again. It's a brilliant book. Anyway, that's all from me. Uh, Enjoy. And I want to hear your thoughts and I want to get your feedback, please. This podcast has been brought to you by Tradey Web Guys, amazing content creation program designed specifically for trade businesses. Now, guys, we have been creating this content because we know how important it is from a search engine perspective for content to be added to websites. And as tradespeople, it's often very low on the priority list. It's not that you guys don't know it needs to be done. It just comes behind everything else, which is fair enough. Now, I just wanted to say quickly, the great thing about content creation is that it helps you guys tell your story. It helps you communicate to customers and potential customers, show them the quality of the work that you guys can do. And it talks to them about, um, I suppose, the caliber of the business that you are. You can exhibit all of that through well-created content. And over at Trady Web Guys, we take care of that for you. So you can head across to tradywebguys.com.au forward slash content dash creation. Uh, You can also get to that from the homepage where you can inquire about that. We've been getting some crazy results. Like last week, we launched one page for a client of ours who's a removalist. And within a week, we had him on the front page of Google. Uh, It's just an amazing result. So it's working really, really well. Uh, Of course, we only have capacity for these things for so many clients because it does take quite a bit of work. So uh, if you'd like to check it out, head across to tradywebguys.com.au, fill in the form, and we will come back to you for give you a little bit more information about that. Thank you. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Al Levy, welcome back to the Site Shed. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I was telling Matt before, the reason that you have not seen this beautiful face is because when I met Matt, he said, I have a face for radio and podcasts. <laughs> I think he meant it as a compliment. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a very endearing compliment here in Australia. Yeah, very nice. yeah you're, you. you're welcome. So, Al, welcome back to the show. Uh, for the listeners out there that are not familiar with you, of course, you have been on the uh, podcast a number of times, and uh, every time you seem to break the internet with awesomeness. So, uh, thanks for joining us back on the show. Pleasure. The, the reason that we're speaking today is because uh, I don't know how you did it. It's some sort of witchcraft on your behalf, but you managed to somehow completely remove a book from my shelf, rewrite it, stick it back on there in the space of six months because I read this book of yours about that time ago, six months, and I loved it. But then I went back and reread it uh, about a, a week, two weeks ago. And um, 
I, I haven't been able to put it down. I've absolutely highlighted the heck out of it. I've, I've like taken notes everywhere. I've gone and built um, Google Sheets off the stuff that I've learned from it and all this kind of crazy stuff. So I don't know how you've managed to do that, but um, I've certainly got to say this book is absolutely amazing. For any of you guys out there that have not read uh, The Seven Power Contractor from Al Levy, uh, you need to get out there and you need to read that straight away. And there's going to be some links to, um, uh, to Amazon within the show notes there where you can go and get it. Al, how did you do that, man? I mean, it's a, it's a testament to book reading, isn't it? Like you can read it once, but you need to go back and read it again. Otherwise, you'll you know, I really appreciate the compliment. But for myself too, there were a couple of seminal books that I read. And one of them was E-Myth by Michael Gerber years ago. And the more I read it, the more deep I could let it sink in on me. And I, I defy anybody to read Ellen Rohr's book, Where Did the Money Go? Enough. As contractors, it's the most important book that you will read to talk about where does the money go? You can do the work and hope the money comes and that's not likely to happen. Pretty and much. So, a, it's a pretty safe bet that anything from Ellen should be uh, consumed, I would say. Yeah, it's just great stuff. And, you know, she really embodies her spirit, but it, it's just a great read. I tell you, I know I'm just going to talk about my book, but I, I have to tell you, one of the things I hated uh, before I had met Ellen was um, <laughs> that I, I would, I'd asked an accountant for uh, what's this term mean? And they give me another stupid accountant term that oh, I wouldn't yeah. understand. Yeah. And I told Ellen when I met her all those years ago is your book for the glossary alone was worth the money. Yeah, right. <laughs> because finally I got an answer like in plain English, what these terms meant, which you have to know and you have to learn to read a bit. You know, we're not going to be accountants and we shouldn't no. be. It's exactly. not what we are doing. We're contractors. But at the end, we, we got to know how to count the money. We got to know how to make the money. And so that's really good. So one of the things is the seven powers. Is, uh, my family was a serial uh, entrepreneurs. We had uh, you know, uh, ice cream stores. We had uh, liquor shops. We had uh, real, multi-state real estate. We owned a radiant heat company. We owned a computer software business. But you know, plumbing, heating, cooling, electric was the main business for us. But my dad used to tell me all the time, people love to tell you their businesses are different. He says, they're about that different. Right. <laughs> and there's like the seven things you have to do. Planning, operations, staffing, sales sales coaching, marketing, financial. And I'm lucky enough that Ellen handles the financial. I know my financials, by the way, but it bores me to death. Yeah. <laughs> Dad, you've got to know, man. You've got to yeah. know it. But I, I, my thing what I love is planning, operations, staffing, you know, and sales in particular. Those in marketing are my five favorites. Of the so, I know you didn't pick your kids, but I did. <laughs> I told you what my five favorite are. There you go. And so I know uh, of late within our community and with a lot of the stuff we're doing at Trady Web Guys and the Site Shared and Trady Mate Pro, uh, it's really heavily geared around systems, processes, and all this kind of stuff, which I know you're mad for. And then even more so, um, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on organizational structure, on org chart, and um, you know, uh, organization departments, because then you can just you can define your roles, and then you can define your responsibilities, and all this kind of stuff. And when I went through and reread this book, I was like, "Holy shit!" I was like talking about everything that I'm learning right now. This is just so amazing. But I suppose back then, when I read it the first time, I wasn't really in that headspace. So then I read it again, and I was like, "This is just it's like." It's like the Bible. Yep. You know, it's kind of like the, the expression when the student's ready, the teacher shows. Um, I will tell you, by the way, not to, again to plug the book, but I have some great bonus material. Uh, right. When they get to the bonus link, I have an organizational chart that I have used from the smallest of companies yep. to the biggest of companies. I'm talking 85 million, you know, yep. that kind of companies. And they run off that org chart. And the, people think they're small. I don't need it. You will always be small yeah. until you create an organizational chart and figure out what goes in in those boxes. Yeah. And that's really kind of the key thing here. Because what I'm finding at the moment, Al, is that pretty much everything stems down from that org chart. There's no point in going and you know, creating systems and processes on roles and responsibilities that don't exist within an org chart. Like, it's just, you're trying to run before you can walk kind of thing. There's nothing to hang it on. And, right. you know, uh, get, do I have time for you to share a quick story? Hell yeah. It's your show, man. Do what uh, you want. So we, did, we didn't have an org chart years ago. You know, I started out of my grandfather's gas station and then my dad and my uncle got together and, you know, went off and did uh, the other part of the business. And then my brothers and I showed up and there was really no, just go work, do something, right? <laughs> and so uh, later on, the company, that was kind of the format. It was just a madhouse and especially New York madhouse, right? So uh, <laughs> this is shocking. I was like, I'm sitting there at the dispatch desk. And it's like 6, 30, 7 o'clock in the morning. 
And I get a phone call from one of the suppliers and goes, you know, Al, um, I, I know you might have overlooked the bill and it hasn't been paid. Well, I got to tell you, Matt, my dad raised us as you run to give your money to the suppliers. Right. Says, because when push comes to shove, they will remember and take care of you, which, yeah. by the way, he was right, right on about that. That is so true. But the point of it is, so I, I went over to the accounts for payable person and go, and I started yelling at him. And my brother, Marty, who's the financial guy, had to come in and walk him off the roof. <laughs> so, so Marty, Marty's in earlier than me, like 6 a.m. And he gets a call from an angry customer about a callback. You know, we have to go back and do service there. And he starts ripping into the service manager. And I walk into the dispatch area. And now I have to walk him off the roof. <laughs> and I just, so I just looked at him, and this is the tone of it, the picture of this tone. And I said, you know what, Marty? You don't know anything about service. You've got a problem. You see me, and I will make sure it's right. <laughs> he said, well, you don't know anything about money or finances. So if you've got a problem, you go see me. And the two of us, was that's where we draw up the org chart, where whose responsibility was to take care of the accounts receivable, accounts payable, service department. My brother Richie was also involved. Before that, we were so busy micromanaging every every little thing that each other were doing. I have more stupidity, at which I'm <laughs> with you. I'm sure. Carry on. Yes, yes, yes. So one of the stupidity things was insurance was really big in New York and the trucking. And of course, you know, it's in cases of plumbing, heating, cooling, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of insurance things. So it was always a big line expense for us. So Richie would go out and get three bids. Al would go out and get three insurance bids. And Marty would go out to get three insurance bids. And we had no time. This is just crazy. So finally, one day, we looked at the org chart and go, hey, Marty, this is your box. You go get the org chart. Get, you get three insurance bids, come back and present it to us. And what a big time saver that was. And obviously, way more effective right. because we didn't know the activities that go on in the box. Now, I'm not talking about a org chart where you have a CEO, CFO, CIO, CIT, you know, all the crazy things that they name these days. This isn't an ego chart. Right. This is the boxes it takes to run your company. Yeah. And then you can write the manuals, uh, which is one of my way, my next program that's coming up is that I am going to be sharing the manuals in a way that I never did before. And thanks in part to people like Matt <laughs> not to, to, to do that, that will become available. But that's great. You know, I have to tell you one of the other things that we were, we were going to get to, Matt, is until we had an org chart, what was the purpose of a meeting? Because we just talk. We would, you know, it was it was wasted. Right. Right. But once you have a uh, org chart and you have manuals, and then this really gets good. It gets really good if you run good type meetings, which I want to share with everybody. Yeah. Because here's what I know out there: you hate meetings. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I suppose that's the perfect segue because um, I reached out to you. I was having some issues with meetings within our um, organization. We had a lot of a lot of people a part of Trading My Pro. We're trying to run these meetings, and I was just turning into a bit of a disaster. And so I, I and I'd literally just gone through that part of your book, and I, I remember I, ra- I rang you from down the beach, and I was like, "Al, I need help with meetings, man. What's what's the go?" And you and you very kindly forwarded me. Um, your uh, guide to more productive meetings, which we're going to run through here. Now, I just want to clarify as well, guys. First of all, go and read the book because the way the book has been designed is it's, it breaks all these things down into sections. What we're talking about today is one specific section of the book. So it will make more sense to you and it will probably resonate a little bit stronger um, if you go that, if you take it in that order. Um, however, today we're going to be talking about um, this little guy here. So I will bring that onto the screen so we can all see it. Uh, so this is the Seven Power Contractor Guide to More Productive Meetings. And yeah, I guess, Al, so the reason that I was reaching out to you was, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there may uh, appreciate or may be in a similar scenario by where they, um, you know, they're, they're, running, they're running meetings, but they're running them for the sake of running meetings and they may not be as productive. They might not have the outcome they want. Um, they may not be structured. It might be a scenario where you, you, know, you, you leave after a meeting and you think, well, that's great. What do we actually achieve here? What's actionable from this? 
Um, so I've got to say that this whole um, manifesto, as you call it, Al, um, it really brought things into reality for me. And as a result, I went and created that Google Doc with this amazing meeting structure, which we've been implementing ever since, by the way, Al, and it's been fantastic. And the feedback that we've got, so um, hear that. the feedback that, we've been, that I've been getting is like, this is the best thing I've ever, the best meeting structure I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? I just came up with that. That's, you know, that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to wrap yourself in it, Matt. Right. I will tell you, let, let's go back up, though. But here's what I, when I said about it, I know why you hate meetings. The reason we hate meetings, Matt, is because, you know, we've been to these uh, meetings at our local house of worship. We've been to these meetings at our local, you know, government things. And it's a meeting to eat a donut, drink coffee, to talk about stuff you talked about the last time that you're going to talk about the next time because nobody has the guts to really do anything. Mm-hmm. Or, 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 or. The meetings that Richie and I, you know, we never had meetings with guys because we thought we didn't have time, but we had plenty of time to run around with our head chopped off. Right. You follow what I'm saying? So Richie would let it go, let it go, let it go. And then in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., he and I are the last tech stand and we're in the office and he goes, you know, we need a meeting. I go, why is that, Richie? Because this guy did something and now we should write a meeting agenda. And the agenda is just, you know, so long because now we've stacked up everything that you, you, did wrong in the last six months and we're going to get it straight in this meeting and since everybody hates to come to those meetings uh, we yeah. had no agenda you know it was total hijack and everybody hates it but that's not what we're speaking to here there now this is a pretty big size guide so right it's not meant to be read it one through page 19 don't freak out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's 10 things and we'll unpack it a little bit. For you. Yeah, exactly right. And, and, and for the guys out there, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, I suppose the bottom line is uh, having structure and consistency within meetings and following a framework will help you yeah. get a better result. And what Al's created here is, is, an, is an amazing framework. Um, so how do you want to run this out? Do you want to just take it away? Well, or let's do let's, let's, let's see, let's take a the 10, the 10 big things that they need to know. So okay. let's think, roll down through that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So this just talks about, you know, why you hate meetings, yep. <laughs> which I was just sharing. This is uh, meeting one, which is the first big thing is figure out who needs to attend this meeting. Why are these people in the seats? Mm-hmm. And if you don't know that, don't have them at the meeting. Don't have, oh, we don't want to hurt Matt's feelings if he mm-hmm. doesn't come to the meeting. Get over it. The only people that are supposed to be in the meeting that it affects those people. So, for instance, there's a problem with taking phone calls. The CSRs, customer service reps, have to be in that meeting. And whoever manages the customer service reps, they have to be in there. They have to listen to calls. There's things that you have to do. You have to be structured. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually find that meetings get out of control once they're over 10 people. Now, you might push it to 15. And if you have a big company, so what do you do? What I used to do, I had multiple meetings. I ran a meeting Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, because... When you go with a really giant-sized group, everybody sits there and goes, this has got nothing to do with me. This right. is because Matt messed up. Yeah. I'm here because of Matt. And so everybody is like, Likely. No. yeah, yeah. So it's got to be, it's got to be, you know, a tight meeting. And then, you know, what is their reason for sitting in the chair? What are you hoping to accomplish? So the, what I call the, you know, uh, with them, what is it that you want to be able to do? Yeah. I also think what happens is, again, having remembered from the days where, you know, we never had meetings. So now we were going to just talk to them for five hours as if that would be effective. So (laughs) short meetings, (laughs) talk at them. Yes. Short meetings done regularly beat long meetings once in a while. So that's really kind of the key thing here is there's got to be a thing. There are other things that are really important, but I think the key thing is before you go into a meeting, what are the three things that you want them to take away from the meeting? Now, if you really get good at this, now this is higher level. And so when I run a meeting, I'm going to talk about the three things that we're going to do. I'm going to unpack those three things. And at the end of the meeting, I'm going to go around and go, so Matt, what is, what's one of the three things we should take away from this meeting? Right. Because when they talk, they listen. Yeah. When you talk, it's like this. They, they just kind of kind of hear it. And so that's really big. So does that tie into the agenda? Yes. Yep. Yes. You got to tie your agenda back to it and you got to stay on, on topic. So so I, the one I always like to, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, I found that's been very powerful. Like having an agenda has really kept the meeting on track and it, it's meant that, okay, listen, guys, we're going to talk about these things today. If there's anything else you want to pop up, we'll stick it in the next meeting agenda, but we need to stay focused on this because we've only got 20 minutes. That's excellent. And yeah. that's, so there's a, a begin and an end time and, end. and yep. you have 
to start on time. Yeah. Because people are in the room and you let somebody come in that hasn't come in on time. You tell everybody there they're an idiot for being on time. And so respecting the power of the meetings, actually one of my clients who is now my franchise partner, the way he took control of his company years ago was he insisted on starting the meetings on time as I had taught him to do. So a guy was walking in, it was late, he kicked the door closed on him. <laughs> he came outside, the guy goes, I was only, he said, stop, read the manual. What does it say about what time this meeting is? The guy read it out loud again, because words that come from your lips, you listen. The next meeting, he was there 15 minutes early. <laughs> and from then on, you, you'd be shocked of taking control of some small things can make a monstrous difference. That's why I'm so excited. I mean, I hated meetings to where I know the super value of well-run meetings. Yeah. So pick the three things that you want. And that's what Matt's talking about the agenda. So I'll do a little role play with agenda. Matt is, this is pretty typical. So we're talking about, you know, where you should park your truck at the shop, you know, with a specific spot and when you unload and when you do all that stuff and Matt puts his hand up and go, I got a question. What your question, Matt, is where do I get my uniform fixed? <laughs> right. So this is where they hijack your meeting. And I go, you know, Matt, that's a great question. But today, today the agenda is about parking. <laughs> so if you'd like to stay later, we'll talk about the uniforms. And if I know it's in the manual about yeah. your uniform, I'm going to stop at the end of the meeting and make you read it out loud. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the key thing. So I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, and I think... You will find if you have a tight agenda, start on time. Here's the other thing. I don't care how great this meeting is. Everybody's engaged. It's really wonderful. And you decide to violate the second bad thing, mm -hmm. which is the end time. Right. You have to end on time. So normally what I tell people is if you're the person running the meeting, which there should always be a meeting coach or a person who's in charge of that meeting, they should be sitting at a place that only they can see the clock. So that they know that they start on time, they know that they're ending on time. And people at the meeting are not, you know, necessarily to look at that. Matt, you were rolling down to that. So this this is really kind of one of the things about you know being really clear about it. I have to tell you, uh, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on my manuals, which I'm sure I've shared with uh, people before here back in '96, and it was well worth it. Within two years, we paid for it. But the purpose of this story is so it's a really cold day. We're in the heating business. I'm in the front of the room going through the manuals in this meeting with the guys. And my brother Marty's in the back of the thing going like this, tapping his watch. <laughs> Nobody sees him. I finish up my meeting and I say, uh, Marty, come outside with me. I said, don't ever do that again. Because here's what I can tell you. Every time I have them in a meeting, their sales go up, their callbacks go down, and their technical performance gets better. Now, you tell me where's a better spent time than that. Mm -hmm. And there is no answer to that. And to Marty's credit, he never did it again. Yeah. But I, I don't care. Unless the building, I, unless the building's on fire, God forbid, that meeting happens. It happens all the time and people know to get there and you will be surprised. Now, again, they need to be participants because we don't, like Matt mentioned, because you don't want to be talking at people the whole time. So if you have a written resource, have them read it out loud. And that's probably another reason why I suppose you typically want to keep meetings relatively within 10 people. If you've got 15, 20 people and they're all trying to be engaged, then it's basically like a screaming battle, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, is this going to tie into... Well, actually, let's just, let's just keep going. Why don't we yeah, keep... I think just so the, the rule is good, which is somebody at the front of this meeting. So if I'm the head of the CSRs, I would typically be the meeting coach, yep. and then I'd have this authority to run the meeting, keep it on track. So if something's going pretty good, and I think it's a you know serving, we're staying on point. I'm going to let it go a little bit, yeah. And then if I see this, I have to watch, and I just do this. I'm out. You know what? That's a great point. I'm going to make a note of it, and then we're going to talk a little bit because there obviously we need a little more time. In the interest of time, let's move on to a little further on the agenda, so we don't. You know, flame out at that point and really lose our momentum. Yeah. That's why it's so important to have a meeting coach. And mm -hmm. there are a couple of good tips for doing that. All meetings, which Matt and I were talking about, you have to have a written agenda. And my recommendation is it's a half a page to a page tops. Oh, yeah. Of which, of which start with, if the meeting went well, what three things did they take away from the meeting? So start with the end in mind. Yep. That makes a big difference. I've actually been following your advice on, uh, on, on that as well and keeping them all to within three to four 
points for each meeting with maybe a hand, you know, two or three subheadings for each of them, but keeping them very strict within the uh, that two to three point, and then anything it's, else goes in the next meeting. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's and again, short, frequent meetings beat these long right. ones. If nothing gets to it. And the roll thing is, after, roll on to three here because I want to share that. Other, so this is just an agenda. Yeah, yeah. Someone other than you, though, because if you're really engaged with everybody, yeah, yeah. somebody has to be taking notes. Right now, they're not writing word for word. This is not a court stenographer, but they're reading the words and they're they're writing them down because. If you take 10 people to a meeting, they will have heard 10 different things. Right. Because we listen through our filters. So the idea is just to highlight these three things. Now, it's basically your agenda. Yeah. Just turned into notes. Right. And people sign off on those notes because now they, if you make them sign off or initial, and you can do it electronically. We don't need to use paper necessarily for this. But then they know there's a accountability for these meetings, which is really, really, it starts to turn it on, on its ear. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. But that makes a big difference. Sorry, I cut you off there, Matt. What were you going to share? I can't remember. That's good. I, I'll keep yeah. going. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, so uh, someone other than you taking the notes, and that's a good sample of the notes. Um, number four here is meetings. We'll so we're talking about that time. And begin. The fewer the people of the meeting, the better. Good, limit the discussion, three main points. Uh, the meeting sacred, not to be disturbed, Marty. Short <laughs> meetings held frequently, uh, not like what Richie used to like to do. Yeah. And here's a good one. How you arrange the seating is really good. So if it's a teaching session, then you can use what I call classroom style. Yeah. So there are tables and you're at the front at a podium having a, you know, a teaching session going on and you can have a whiteboard, you can have the computer projection, whatever you think you need to keep it interesting. You know, talk, talk, talk gets a little boring. So if you yeah. can bring in the media, it really does help. If it's a discussion, so everybody's equal. So if I'm up front at the podium and you're down in those classroom seats, I'm in charge, clearly. But if we sit in a, either a square or a round table, then this is meant to be a discussion and no, very participatory. Yep. I'll give you a quick tip on that, though. Yeah. Don't pick people in order because it tells the last person, I don't have to pay attention till you get to me. So hopscotch your way around for participation. So for a lot of um, a lot of the guys, and myself in particular, um, the meetings typically don't take place in an office location. They're they're online like we are now. They're a Zoom meeting. Yes. There. Yes. <clears throat> Is there any right or wrongs in regard to? I mean, I, I mean, you can't see people on a Zoom meeting, right? You've just, got, you've just got to be there. You know, it's very funny. For years before go to meeting and all this other, more video has come available, I can tell when people are tuning out. I can hear the stuff in the background, and I go. Did you have to take that call right now? Yeah. And people go like, do you have it? So you can tell the communication. I do love the visual aspect of it. All kidding aside, because, you know, 70% of our communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. Not my talking. It's, you know, my expression, how I move my head, my, you know, eye roll. Those kinds of things really <laughs> tell a lot into the conversation. So the video thing is really good, but it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Somebody's in charge of that meeting. Somebody's keeping it on track. Somebody's staying on the agenda. Somebody's taking notes. And we're going around the room. So I, I have a big garage door company that's in 10 states in the United States here. They're up to 30 million in sales already. They're really going places. But we have a you know stand up on our feet uh, meeting. We go around the room and we don't go in order. We do everything that's in here. We do mm -hmm. the exact same thing online in a virtual environment. Yeah, well. All right, cool. So what else have we got? The last one there. Yeah, the quality of the meeting. So oh, you, can tell me, yeah, you can tell me your meeting's really important, but then you put me on a broken chair with right. no air conditioning or no heating and the lights are blinking in the background. How, how important is your meeting? So if you're going to find a meeting room and it doesn't have to be, you know, it depends if you're using it as a, as a tra training room. Uh, usually I recommend for 15 people about uh, 15 by 20 is a good size meeting room. Don't have to have a very fancy floor. You know, you can put down linoleum, tile, whatever you want to do. These tables out here, they're plastic basically, but they're good. And then the chairs, you know, it depends on how long your meeting is. I recommend 30 minute, one hour. Training sessions, two hours, four hours. That's different training sessions. Anything more than four hours of training. The adage that has always been for trainers is the mind can only absorb what the butt can stand. Right. And if you go past that, <laughs> you're wasting your time. <laughs> just wasting your time. Yeah, yeah. We interrupt this podcast today to talk to you very quickly about Tradey Web Guys content creation program. 
That program has been designed specifically for trade-based organizations as a way that you guys as trade business owners can start creating content that enables you to engage better with your customers and your potential customers. It will enable you to build trust and build rapport because what you're doing is you're investing in educating them. Biggest problem that we see with our customers today is that they're not regularly updating their websites. And that's a problem because first of all, the search engines are looking for that. And second of all, potential customers are also looking for it. Trading Web Guys content creation program has been specifically designed to help you get regular, relevant content on your website consistently every month. We know that it's hard when you're out there on the tools, and we know that sometimes you don't always have the time to be able to do these things yourself. So we're taking it off your hands for you. It's a service that we're offering for you guys. We want to make sure that you're getting this done because we know how important it is. Anyway, head across to tradywebguys.com.au forward slash content, fill in the form, and one of our representatives will come back to you. All right, cool. So scrolling down then, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the types and frequency? Yeah, I do, I do want to talk about some of these uh, meetings. So one of the meetings, and this is uh, Ellen and I put this together years ago for our mutual, we call power partners. And um, so the meeting with you, is just what it says. Mm -hmm. I have a top five and Matt's heard me talk about the top five, you know, so there's a master project list of 100, 125 things that you're going to get done in the next three to five years. And then you boil it down to your top 30, which is uh, either going to fix your biggest problem or challenge or greatest chance to grow and be profitable. And that's one year. And then you sort it again, using those same filters down to your five that you're working on. So every week, no matter how crazy your week is, you said, you said that these five things would make the biggest impact, biggest, solve the biggest problem challenge, the greatest chance of growing profitable. So there is nothing that you can do all week that will be more important than that. But life hits you, right? So this meeting with you, mine is on Sunday. Every Sunday, I have a recurring uh, appointment in my Outlook. And in that meeting with me, my top five are there. My goal for seven power contract is there. How I'm going to create that money, who I'm going to be working with. I really take the time to have written it out, and I edit it each time, including where my clients are, what do I need to do, some other work that I have to get out. You know, So all of it is there. It is two things. It's kind of like GPS in that you're a little off, this, and it helps you drive back to where you said you want to go. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell you, everybody that I've trained to do this meeting with you, they do not skip a week. Now, if you're always waiting to your meeting with you to work on your top five, stop and ask yourself why right. you know once in a while i will do that i will tell you matt you know we all have a crazy week but if it's every week and you don't look and do anything on your top five you've got to rededicate yourself you've got to build some time in your calendar because that's where time is created yeah. if you don't block out time in your calendar then you're not ever going to get it done so that's what the meeting with you is really about mm-hmm. uh the daily schedule meeting is <laughs> Stuff happens, right? You know, the you have an install and there's no installer today. You have service calls and there's no service guys. Uh, the CSR is out of the office today. Stuff happens. So this daily meeting, you're on your feet. No sitting down for this meeting. This is a uh, okay. Who's here? Who's there? What can we cancel? What can we move? So typically, I have you know the service manager, the install manager, the key people there want to know what it is, and we just do what we call triage, like an emergency room, if you will. That's what that meeting's about. Okay. The service tech get it sold meeting is all of the service techs. So their job is to talk to customers, make good recommendations, do operationally keep the place neat and clean, and also do the good technical work. So where does that get taught and where does it get trained? Every week they're coming to a meeting. So if you track sales, and I hope you do, they come and see how they did. There's no reason for us to do homework if mom and dad are never going to look at it, is there? Right. And, so the, and th- so that one's a weekly meeting? A weekly meeting. Every yeah. week. There's no reason that they shouldn't know where they are. Look, if, if, you, if you bowl or in American football or whatever sport you play, golf. Ne- neither, mate. We're in Australia. Uh, Australian rules football. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Australian rules football. You know, the, you do play golf. Uh, you you got to keep score. And it's yeah. not a bad thing. Uh, you know, nobody's going to hurt, but th- there is accountability. But it's not a sales meeting alone. Sales, operational behavior, and technical. And of course, if you have manuals and you have training and you have a training center, this all gets better. Mm-hmm. That's what the service tech meeting is about, is, you know, how do we do? 
Um, and then that's really kind of, a, and then the number four is the individual coaching, which is, so there's a group session, but how did I do this week? And so you look at my stats, you might, you know, whoever I report to my field supervisor or service manager, and this is your opportunity to tell me the good, the bad. Now it's not a beat up session because that's no fun to go to on a regular thing. And just say, Al, what's the one thing you could do next week based on these stats that could be better? So my closing rate might be higher. My average ticket could be better. Uh, there's a couple of different things. Am I offering a planned maintenance agreement, uh, which is in all of this is in the customer's best interest. And so Everything is that- I recommend is customer best interest. At the risk of asking a dumb question here, is that individual service tech coaching meeting, is that like a one-on-one or can that be done in a group environment? No, the service tech get its sold meeting is the group. Right. And then when that's over, they go off and have an individual five-minute meeting. Okay. Five minutes. Five minutes you're spending with me. And now, of course, like Service Titan and many of these other softwares are tracking the key stats. Do yourself a favor. Don't have 50 freaking stats. There are four, maybe five key stats that make yeah. all the difference, like conversion rate that I was talking about, yeah. your average ticket, callback ratio, which is how many calls did you go on and how many of them bounced back. Mm-hmm. Now, when I say bounce back, that could be for a couple of reasons. You sold it yesterday. Today, they're calling to complain about the price. You didn't build the value. Uh, they're not complaining about the price and the heat works, but you decided you didn't want to wear those shoe covers. So there's mud all over their white carpet. That's operational. Right. And technical is I have no heat again today. That's an issue. So those would be reasons that we would look at your callback ratio. Okay. Those that I like are my key stats. Okay. So then the CSR, DSR. Yep. They're answering the phones. They're dispatching. And in our particular case, they have a CSR manual. They have a dispatcher manual. And if so, they just take turns going around the, the table with the manuals. Also, you know, Matt, people do not know what they sound like when they're on the phone. Right. So I do this routine, which is New Yorkers, you know, we had a long script and New Yorkers have a, a millisecond of attention. So like, we can say, you know, good morning. It's OSI. Wonderful day. And, you know, they go, boom, they shut you right down. Right. So I came up with, uh, you know, good morning. Al speaking, OSI, how may I help you? Or, you know, it was uh, good morning, couple specialists, Al speaking, how may I help you? And then I would do it this way is, good morning, comfort specialist, how can I help you? <laughs> same words, same words, right? Same words. So, but the point of it is they think they handled that customer complaint really well, but you don't know what you sound like when you're in the middle of it. So right. the recording of phone calls, which of course software makes so much easier these days, right. that's one of the things that you would do at a CSR dispatcher meeting. Dispatcher meeting would talk about is, you know, where are we having some issues? Uh, Al always wants to go home at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's nice for Al, but not for, you know, everybody else who has to stay out late and cover the calls. Mm. So there are some things that we do in these kinds of meetings, but- And is that, a, is that a weekly? That is a weekly meeting. Yep. Again, these could be short meetings. Okay. And in these agendas I have that I share with you in this thing about what a typical length for those meetings are. Okay. There's plenty to discuss. Yeah. Here's what I think about CSRs, just so we're really clear. You, Mr. Marketing Manager Matt, is phenomenal at getting our phones to ring off the hook. And I, Al, hate customers, and I'm a customer service rep. So I am, you are filling the bathtub with calls. <laughs> And I have the drain wide open. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have to work with your CSRs, your customer service reps, all the yeah. time. And your dispatchers. Because here's the other thing. <laughs> dispatchers, everywhere I've ever been, Matt, think they're the boss of the techs. Oh, yeah. X think they're the boss of the dispatchers, and they're both wrong. <laughs> when you guys get the org chart, buy my book, you get the org chart, you will see that neither one of them are bosses. Their job, if they have a dispatcher has a problem with the techs, their job is to bring it to the service manager's attention. Yeah. And if the techs are having a problem with an abusive dispatcher, their job is to bring it. To, and then the service manager gets everybody in the room and gets this resolved. Mm-hmm. We got to work as a team. So marketing, ma- uh, marketing manager meetings. So in charge of the marketing manager, there's a marketing manual. And there are things that you need to be doing, which is for me is the right amount of calls from the right customer at the right time. In a nutshell, that is what a marketing manager is all about. That's Mm -hmm. what they have to be doing. And I believe, as does Ellen, that an owner, no matter how big your company is, you never really get to leave the marketing manager. It's too important. Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading, actually, I think I highlighted that in the book as well. I remember you're talking about that that specifically. I think it was when you were were talking about how um, uh, you you hired your, your dad's 
uh, colleague to do the marketing when you rebranded and all Leo. this sort of stuff. Yep, Leo. Yep. But the first rule is you don't question me or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> rule one, don't question Leo. Number two yeah. is when you think to question Leo, don't. <laughs> but he, was, he was great. He taught me so much about marketing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, really, and to me, so the guys out there, sales and marketing are two sides of the same coin. Right. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, we always have this discussion about chicken and the egg, Matt. So Ellen, years ago, we just like, you know, we love talking about business. And Ellen just said, to me, so what comes first, marketing or sales? And I said, sales. She goes, well, if the phone doesn't ring, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. If I don't know what makes Matt, my ideal customer tick and how I can reach that person when I'm face to face, my chances of finding a hundred, a thousand, a million mats is minimalized. So the better you are at sales, in my belief, the better you are at understanding what your marketing message is and how to target market. And of course, today's technology just makes that so great. Right. Because you can do so many great things. Yeah. Sorry for going off. I like marketing, as you can tell. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the install or get it done meeting, that is, uh, just so we're clear about install is somebody else sold it. Now I'm coming to do it. So you sold the water heater. I'm coming to install it. You sold the boiler, the furnace. I'm coming to do it. You sold the air conditioners. I'm coming to do it. My job is to bring the job in on time and on budget for materials. And then if I do that, typically in our case, we we give them some reward. But well, again, there's a scorecard for this. Otherwise, what's the consequences for not hitting the target and the parameters? So we talk about, you know, typically what went right this week, celebrate. What went wrong, let's fix it. And then what do we have to look ahead? So here's my uh, story about looking at, we, we never looked ahead, Matt, never, never looked ahead. <laughs> and magically, Monday would be crazy busy, not enough guys, or it was dead. And now what do we do with ourselves? You know, so the other thing was, um, you know, in rooftop units, where they have to have a crane to lift them up on the top. Mm-hmm. Well, if it's nobody's job, then either nobody does it or two people order the crane. So we would have no cranes or two cranes on a job. Both are bad scenarios. Right. So this installer get it done meeting was a great opportunity for us to find out where is the rigid 300? Where's the pro press? Where are the things that we need to get staged out for that job? That's what this really takes install to such a better level. Because I, I looked at, again, it's very funny. I, Richie and I had a conversation, again, one of these crazy nights when the two of us are left standing. And I just said, Richie, I don't need any more practice at install. I'm really good at it. I can sell it really good. You know what? I like to make money at install. And this is where that became is, you know, we just started to talk about. It. So we project material and labor versus actual material and labor. Did we win? And that's really so big. And you would think everybody has a grasp of this, Matt. They don't. Mm. And then if they do, they don't do a good job of letting the installers successfully win and do this job right. So and, would, uh, that's the big thing. Is that meeting typically with the installers? Would that be with the dispatch or the like the service manager or something? Like who are they? Who's that meeting with? The, the installers are typically run by an install manager, depending on okay. how many installers you run. And so that'd be so operations, here's, here's, yeah. Yeah. So here's a rule of thumb: typically, if you run three crews a day. You probably only need an install field supervisor for that. Right. That means they have to work in the field. By the time you get to five crews a day, you're going to need a manager. It just becomes too much to manage the schedule and things of that nature and training. Yeah. Because obviously you want to be doing the training as well. That's big. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does that cover it? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, system engineer. Comfort yeah, in America. Advisor. Yeah. So we, we weren't allowed to call. We're not allowed to call ourselves salespeople anymore. Oh, Dirty word. Okay. So we became system engineers, comfort advisors, system advisors, whatever name you want to pick. Basically, it's a big ticket salesperson. Right. So this is uh, you know selling the bigger stuff. And those two, uh, so a system engineer uh, years ago proved to me that they could bring me all the dollars I wanted and I could go broke. Right. But if you're just going to charge on dollars, then they can sell it as cheap as they want or not figure enough. So I changed the equation to... Um, so many closed. So you get 10 opportunities, Matt, you got to close five of them. There's an average ticket. And then the jobs that you sold have a projected material and labor and a gross profit. And then the installer has got to bring that job in on time for the, you know, the material and labor that you had figured. And did we win? So it's what I call seven out of 10 jobs going green. Mm. Green is hit those limits. Now people go, well, I can do better than that. I'm going to defy you. You go prove that to me first. Here's what I can tell you. 
If you could hit seven out of 10, the way I just described, you're going to make money. You're a rock star. Yeah. I was just curious while we're on that, it's a bit of a segue, but um, is one of the metrics that you would incorporate into that specific role, so the the uh, upsell guy or whatever, the big ticket sales guy, ticket salesman. Yep, yep. is one of the metrics, does one of them revolve around uh, like customer feedback and satisfaction? Because I know I've yes, worked in- Yes, 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 yes. That's a great point. And same thing, by the way, for service techs too, is online reviews are the lifeblood these days. Now, I still like for big ticket sales, if I've done a great job of you know selling you a furnace or an air conditioner, heating system, a new plumbing bathroom that you love, my job is to say, you know what, in two weeks, I'm going to be back. Matt, when we get done, I'm going to make sure everything is the way I promised it would be. And at that time, I'm going to hope that you're so satisfied you'll be willing to do a short video or take a picture and testimonial for me so I can share this with other people. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised how many people will do that. Yeah. Now, that does not trump out the you know, online reviews. But yes, by all means, look, I, I had to get a mover. I was telling Matt, I'm moving to another place. I, not because they chased me out of here, <laughs> because I'm ready to go. <laughs> but uh, it's a case of, where do you think I went? I went online to check out the reviews. Right. We all do it. I don't even go out to get a hamburger right. without going to Yelp. How's yeah. that? Yeah. So Matt is right. Yeah, that's a piece of it. I, it's not the biggest piece, but it is, can be one of your key stats to measure. So for instance, if uh, if he sold a hundred jobs and I don't have five to ten percent positive reviews, you ought to find out how he sold those jobs or she. Right, and I, and I know that's a problem that a lot of the guys have had with that um, incentivizing their technicians. Where it gets to the point where they're just selling stuff because they know they can make money out of it, and it's not within the customer's interest. Yes. So let's stop that for a second. If we have, I, I'm going to let you keep track of the time. You do not have permission from me to sell anything to a customer that's not in their best interest. That yeah. said, you are the total solution provider. Now, I've been on YouTube for 10 minutes. Who do you think knows plumbing better, you or me? Right. The reality is the customer. Now, we can never insult what they've learned online or anything else of that nature, but you're there to protect them against themselves because they will do stupid stuff. Yeah. Now, I'm not turning a blind eye. If I go downstairs and there's a, an old valve at the water main, I'm going to make the recommendation that, to replace it. Now, if you choose not to, and that's your only shutoff, okay, but it's not because I didn't do it. If I see a 15, 20-year-old water heater, I'm going to make a recommendation to replace it mm. because I have seen too many people suffer with, it is no fun when your water heater blows out. <laughs> it is no fun. Water is incredibly damaging. Yeah. So. Is that selling people stuff that that's not, they shouldn't get? No, Matt. Absolutely not. That's why I teach sales power and I actually call my sales system ethical selling. Yeah. Because you will get all the money if you ask good questions, shut up, listen long enough to what they are. Now, if they don't want it. So, for instance, here, warm air heat is a, is a problem, which is people, you know, dry eyes, scratchy throats, very common. So I'll ask, is anybody in the house you know, allergic? Do they have any problems with dry eyes? No. And 90% of the time, they're going to go, yes. Is that something you want me to pr- come up with a solution for that? And more times than not, they will. They want humidifiers or whatever. So I don't think of myself as selling anybody anything that's not in their best interest. Sorry yeah. for going a little off to the side there. But that's a big point. Yeah, That is a really big point. You've got to nip it in the bud if, they, if you think. That's why I also recommend mystery shoppers. You've heard me talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they can be your relatives or family, anybody that doesn't have the same last name. But yeah, do it. you've got to find out what's going on before that happens. Mm. So a manager operational financial quick check. That's basically where uh, Ellen sets this meeting up with all the managers across that top line of the org chart. Come together and look at this one page thing that she called a financial quick check. Is, is the money sorting out the way we had the budget? So she teaches how to do a budget. And then we got. To, if we don't ever look at our budget, then the budget's not worth the invisible Excel Google sheet that you put it on. Mm-hmm. This is what that's about. It's about making financial decisions in real time. Mm-hmm. That's what that meeting is. Planning power remote, which is what I have with my clients, is uh, sometimes it's it's good to have a roundtable, uh, you know, an outside source, somebody, not even necessarily your industry, but this is what I do for clients. Is uh, I have a, re- a meeting with them, and here's what I do with them. Gotcha. Let's go through the top five. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, because we're not talking about anything until we know what's happened with the top five. Yeah. 
So the financial manager, which is another role that Ellen and I both believe that a manager owner never gets to leave because the money's too important, is they're looking at the end of the month checklist. They want to know is money in the bank, who owes what money, how old the money is. So there's a series of things to check off on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Technical development trade training is what she's talking about. My training is I did. I got tired of the retreads in the industry and I just finally created my own. I took apprentices not like legal, but young, willing people that I could train skills to. And so I made them into apprentices to junior techs, junior techs to senior techs, senior techs to field supervisor. And then they ran on my branches and different places that I own. So I still teach the same method. And that is centered around manuals and a working training center. And if you don't have a working training center, use your house, donate your labor, whatever you think you got to do. But at the end of it, there's only so many techs out there. And I, having been to Sydney, I know this is a problem Mm. and and it's not different than any other city here. They're not, you're trying to steal each other's labor and hope you find somebody good. The problem is you don't get to pick who you hire. You get the whole thing. Mm. So I want young, willing people that I can put them out in the field, get some training for them, just like I got, and then bring them into class and the training and teach them the sales operation technical. If they're going to be a service tech communications operation technical, if they're going to be an installer, and then those have always been the best people. And all of the best, fast grower, long staying clients of mine have all followed that same model. Mm. Absolutely same thing. Brilliant. So, yep, yep. And the last one is this, just a company wide strategic financial update meetings. Basically, just, you know, we wanted to have our company go from 2 million to 4 million. How did we do? So it's just, uh, you can even, some people use like a graphic yeah. thermometer and they just split it up and see where they are. So, yeah. And how often do you run that one? That one is typically uh, every quarter. Yep. Okay. Every qu- every month, every quarter, you can you know just kind of know where you are. Depends on how you've divided up the contest. So I mean, it's a lot of meetings, right? It is a lot of meetings. But here's thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. <laughs> when I get the you know like I used to give guys like ten pages, they go whoa. I go first of all, the daily meeting is five minutes. Right. The one to one meetings are five minutes once a week. Most of these are there's daily, weekly, monthly quarterly, yearly meetings. So mm-hmm. when you see the whole list, don't freak out. Mm-hmm. Don't freak out. And if you run a 20-minute meeting or a 15-minute meeting where you're not running a meeting and you use an agenda once a week, it will be the best time and money that you've ever spent. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So moving down. So these are the actual, I shared this with uh, Matt, we put our agendas right here. You, there's nothing for you to invent. Okay. Uh, you are welcome to edit this thing to do whatever it is, but this, just like it says here, okay, by, cool. by calendar, you're going to see that meeting. Yep. It's right there. And it tells you who should be attending, me, and oh. what is it that I'm doing. And it, here's what I, Ellen uh, likes, what I always talk about right there, Matt. Roll up a little bit. This thing right here, see where it says notes? I got this habit from years ago, is that no matter what time I finished my day, whether it was 4 a.m., I didn't go to bed, so I looked at my calendar and did it feel good. Didn't do it, still need to do it, move it. Um, you know, didn't do it. Who am I kidding? I've been doing this forever. So now I have to decide, do I delete it? Do I delegate it? Do I outsource it? What do I do with it? And then I update my calendar. These are really big things that I do in, uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, right. I like exactly. it. So these are the agendas, again, for the daily meeting. This is, like I said, 15 minutes. So, so this, that this basically about, runs I, through the I, agendas for the, everything above here, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So everyone goes, oh, look at all this stuff. How does this work? And this basically tells them how they can do it. Yep. And everybody is not in every meeting. They right. shouldn't be. Only right. the right people are in it. So all of this is what you're seeing here. I've yeah. shared a lot here with you. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. And I, I mean, I, I, I encourage, I suppose, the listeners out there or the viewers to um, uh, definitely just go and download, get hold of this document and just apply it. I mean, that's the most important thing you can do. Off the back, of course, of reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, by the way, Matt, and I didn't rehearse it, but I, I would say I read, when I put that book together, just so that you're clear, I, I not only for my 25-year career, but also working 60 years with other contractors, but I've been writing articles. I have 250 articles at a minimum, and I can't even count how many blogs I had. <laughs> so when I hired Helena, who Matt knows, Helena was an editor. She goes, if you have all that stuff, what do you need me for? And I said, I've got 250 of my kids in the audience, and they're all saying, pick me. <laughs> yeah. and, you can, and it would look like a ransom note. 
And thankfully, <laughs> Helena came in and put a spline to it. But I was insistent to her, Matt, is that we as contractors are busy and a big fat book is not what I want. I could make, trust me, making a big fat book is the easiest thing to do. Right. Making it small. That's the challenge. That's the toughest challenge. Yes. <laughs> that, that is the toughest challenge. And then I went to uh, do the audio for it. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a thin book. It won't take that long. It's two and a half hours of these velvet tones right. that you get to listen to <laughs> as you're driving in Sydney traffic or wherever, you're, wherever you guys drive. Because I know the traffic you guys got. Yeah. You got monumental traffic. So whatever it is, if you're an audible guy, if you're a you know digital download device or a paperback, it's 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 well worth the read. Not because I wrote it, but I, I honestly, Matt knows me well enough. I struggled. I was lucky. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I was very lucky because I was going to be a dead rich guy was never my goal. Right. And, and it, for not for great mentors like Dan, like Ellen, and my dad mm-hmm. was great. Sarah Miller, a lot of great people came into my life, and I. I fervently believe that if you've been given a gift, it's your obligation to give back. I don't want to sound like a holy roller. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Are you hearing me, folks? Yeah, no. I I do know that if you read this and apply yourself at all, it's going to make a big difference for you because I just had enough experience with everybody, every place I've done it. And I've done my best to put in this. And I said there's more tools coming, but you know what? At the end of it, you got to pick up the toolbox, my friends. Exactly right. And so, Al, I'm um, just, I suppose, I'm conscious of the of the time that yep. you've invested already with us, and for the listeners out there or the viewers, um, where can people get hold of the book? What's the best place to get it? What's the, I mean, I'll I'll have this PDF available uh, yeah. through the SciShed.com so they can get it and the links yeah. to whatever. But is it through? I, I would say, Amazon? I would say that you know. You're welcome to go to my website. There's a lot of great blogs and information there, and we've set it up so that you can think of it as a great library uh, because I've been putting that stuff out there. But for the book itself, uh, whether you buy the paperback, whether you buy the uh, e- you know the digital ebook, or in this case, Audible. So the, I would say Amazon is your best friend, especially because of shipping and everything else that you have. My recommendation is go right to Amazon. They will direct you back. There's a link uh, to go and get the bonus content. Yes. Just like this, there's a really good stuff that goes yep. with it. It doesn't supplant that you got to know the stuff first to apply the tools that are shared with that bonus. And I actually went through those bonus materials yesterday and they're, they're brilliant. They're so good. Thank you. <laughs> so, I've been at it a while. Yeah, no kidding. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool. And so, guys, what I'm going to do also is, um, as I mentioned before, off the back of um, uh, Al helping me um, with this meeting structure, I've created a bit of a framework which anyone's welcome to i'll put a link to this in the um in the show notes as well if you want to come along you just need to click on make a copy <clears throat> and um al if you if you want me to refine this by all means i'll happily do so but i've got links to all our websites and stuff uh his meeting manifesto and whatnot in here uh you can basically click on this and make it your own you're more than welcome to do that so i'll put some more links and stuff in there to the youtube um to the uh sorry not youtube what do you call it um amazon uh, book page, of course, because you really need to read this first, guys. It is well worth it. And as Al said, it'll take you a few hours. I also agree with that, by the way. <laughs> it was designed to read more than once. Right. And uh, how, how much time we got left? Hey, man, we, we got all day. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to give a quick story. So <laughs> Ellen, Rohr, Ellen Rohr, my good friend, sends me a Christmas gift, a box, I was going to say a couple of years ago, but DVDs that I was supposed to plug in my car and listen to. And it was on sales. And I said to myself, are you kidding me? All the years of my doing sales, she sends me sales training. So I plugged the first DVD in that. And the guy says, if you buy this set and you don't listen to it six times, you wasted your money. And I'm going, whatever. So then I'm listening to this stuff and I'm going, I do that. And then I go, I do that too. <laughs> then I go through the whole thing at the end. And then at the, the voice was in my head about you got to listen to it six times. And I plug it in the next time, Matt. And this is what I start doing. I go, I used to do that. Right. I used to do that too. <laughs> it's, I, and I, I got humbled in a hurry because whether you do or you don't, it's, it, I had to keep let it washing over me. It got me redirected back to some, and I learned some great stuff out of it too. So, yeah. It, it, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to buy the book, read the book, do yourself a favor, 
yeah. carve out time to get to read or listen to it twice and you'll be well served. And I think as well, as powerful as it is to be able to listen to it, I think it also does serve you quite well to sit down with a cup of, cup of coffee for 20 minutes in the morning and actually read through a book because there's certain things you know you can highlight within books that you just can't do when you're listening or you know if the phone rings or like it's there's something there's a bit of power in in that i think like it, it sort of resonates on a on a more of a conscious level it does the, the eye hand connection as texts we know how powerful that is so what matt is speaking to is that is the same thing with the book right all right, Al, I want to thank you for your time. I know it's getting late over there, so um, yeah. much appreciated. We'll let you get back to, back to Natalie. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I demand it for me. All right, guys, have a great year. Good talking to you all. Rock and roll. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our Toolbox Talks. Uh, you'll get sent a weekly notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.